Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the US Reduces meeting. Thank you all for coming. My name is Anne-Marie Bonneau. I run Silicon Valley Reduces. I'm in Northern California, and I write the blog, The Zero Way Chef. And uh, I'll just ramble a little bit while everyone's entering the room. So um, I'm going to talk about a book that I'm reading that I love. Oh, and here, I, I don't know if you can see it. I have on my phone. Oh, you can't. See. It says read a book. It's <laughs> all the apps that suck up all my time. And I have read a book. So it kind of helps. Anyway, so this is what I'm reading right now. What if we get it right? It's an advanced reader copy. It's out September 17th by Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. And if you don't follow her on social media, highly recommend you do. She's awesome. So she's a marine biologist and she's she's great. So she was one of the editors of All We Can Save, which came out in 2020. So this is her new book. And she asks all of these people working in all different sectors so policy, money, um, green building, uh, what section am I on now? Uh, oh, like film and storytelling. She asks them all, what will it look like if we get climate right? And this book is about climate and it's joyous. So she gets through the really depressing stuff at the beginning and then, um, you know, gets into it. There's so much good work going on. It's it's really amazing. And a big part of it is working with groups, like working in your community, working instead of just focusing on the individual, like working with a larger group that can affect change, which I think is what we do here. And Jill's gonna talk about something that she's doing, which falls into that. And just one more thing, if you haven't seen it, so Ayana Johnson, she does this Ben Chart thing. I think she's done a TED talk about this and she posted on social media. And she says, if you're wondering like how you can help, think about what brings you joy, what are you good at, what needs working, and then where those things overlap, that's what you can work on. So it's out September 17th. Not getting paid to tell you to read it. <laughs> she posted, you know, if anybody in the press wants an advanced reader copy, hit me up. So I was like, oh, they send me one. So anyway, so that's my my welcome ramble. <laughs> thanks. And, and uh, you, yeah. you can oh. ramble anytime. Well, in fact, we, oh, thank we you. always we you have a command performance. We we always want you to ramble. <laughs> oh good oh um, thank you Anne marie's <laughs> ramblings are always golden yes. um, so welcome everyone and um we've got already great turnout tonight um about 27 people i think uh participating and we've got a great uh lineup i'm going to go through the agenda but i first want to just say thank you everyone for being here if you want to take a moment and just put your name and what your affiliate, you know, which reduces group you're with. And for those of you who don't have a group, welcome, especially you, because this is a great place to get started. Um, hopefully you'll get lots of great ideas and energy and inspiration. That's the whole point of us getting together. It's just a voluntary umbrella group uh, for folks trying to reduce waste in their communities. So just while we're uh, getting, if, if you don't mind putting your name and your affiliation in the chat, that'd be great. I will just say I'm Stephanie Miller. I'm uh, the founder of DC Reduces. I started all by myself, but I now have five other volunteers. We have a lot of fun. Uh, we've got 65 businesses in Washington, DC signed up. For those of you who don't know, the sticker, um, the groups that have it have their each have their own sticker looks something some variation of this and the idea about it is just getting it in shop windows 
to make that communication really easy between the shop owners and the customers. No problem if customers come in with their own fill in the blank, their own reusable mug, coffee mug, bag, dry cleaning, garment bag, uh, takeout containers. Yeah, you was just showing all the, the stickers. Um, and um, what we're really hoping is that if you have not yet started a group, that we can try to convince you how easy it is to do, because it really is just takes a little bit of your time and willingness to order the stickers. That's that's really it. You don't need to get really fancy. You can start getting fancy with the website, but you don't have to start there. Okay, so uh, let me move to the, oh, it's great to see everybody's faces. Um, let me move to the agenda slide so I can just tell you what to expect this evening. Um, so we have a wonderful speaker. I'm gonna introduce her in a moment. Um, after the introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Yayoi, who has some really exciting announcements to make. Uh, then uh, Jill, uh, who is, uh, you're going to hear from in a moment, uh, one of our founding members of U.S. Reduces, has done what we all wish we had time and energy to do. She's done it for us. She's written the letter we all wanted to write, and you'll hear what I, you'll you'll hear about that from her in a moment. Then we've got our um, fantastic guest speaker, Amber Schmidt, uh, joining us, and we'll have time for Q&A with her. And then we always have time at the end, and we really hope you'll stay for the breakout groups. Um, we've got some leading questions we wanted to ask you as we go into those breakout groups. We'll, we'll um, go over those shortly, and they're small groups, so you can feel like you can really have a conversation. And then we'll wrap it up. Uh, we will be done by 8.30. Obviously, if you need to go before that, um, you're welcome to, but we really hope you'll stay for the breakout conversations. Those are always a lot of fun. Okay, so with that, let me turn it over to Yayoi for the exciting announcements. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, thrilled today uh, to have you all here. Uh, for uh, those of you who don't know me, I am Yayoi, and um, today is a very exciting evening because we are announcing uh, a couple of really great news. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you who are here today, and you know who might who also people who couldn't make it today, working you know who are working hard to uh, promote a BYO and uh, waste reduction. Uh, your creativity and dedication to promoting, uh, you know, low waste lifestyle and low waste society uh, have been truly inspiring. Okay, first, uh, ta -da! I'm so excited to announce that uh, Austin uh, Reduces launched. Uh, I couldn't uh, put it in the newsletter. But I'm super, super excited. Uh, it's the first group in Texas. So uh, lots of, uh, you know, uh, applause. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are super excited. Uh, thank you for those who are involved in uh, making it happen. I heard that a lot of high school students are working on this. And uh, it, it seems like there are a lot of people involved in the Austin chapter. And uh, very excited. Thank you. Uh, and you can uh, check them out at Austin Re Reduce Coalition on Instagram. Uh, please follow them and, you know, we can amplify each other. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, announcements uh, for the next October speaker. Um, we already have uh, a speaker uh, confirmed. Uh, thank you so much to Stephanie. Uh, she uh, she talked to uh, the executive director of Just Zero, Kirsty Hetchy. I think we are. I'm just like messing up uh, her last name's pronunciation. So it's a by the time she comes to speak, we'll figure out how to pronounce her last name. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Kirsty, but like uh, we are super excited um, uh, to. Uh, we are super excited. Uh, to um, have her confirmed. So uh, please um, 
registration is already open and it's going to be on October 8th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific and 6 p.m. Uh, Central. So uh, please uh, uh, sign, sign up. Uh, if uh, uh, Amy could please uh, drop the link, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, okay. Uh, could... Thank you, thank you, Amy. Uh, if I could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Mm. Look at that. A little bit more. Okay. okay. Yes. So another exciting announcement is like uh uh, uh we uh had a plastic free July social media contest announced on our email newsletter. Uh if you are not subscribed, please do. It's on our Substack, uh, substack.com slash US reduces. And um, uh, here are the winners, uh, three winners. Uh, we picked three winners. Um, uh, I'm uh, very excited. Uh, so uh, congratulations uh, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we are super excited. Uh, so uh, Amy, if you could move to the next slide. Yes, okay. Grand Strand Reduces um, from South Carolina. Um, Diana Moreno um, is the leader of the uh, uh, program. And uh, we really liked uh, the, her Facebook group. Uh, she is um, uh, keeping posting and, and trying to gain tractions. And she also has an Instagram. And you can also find her as Mindful Food Chef uh, on Instagram and Facebook. And um, uh, we really uh, appreciated uh, her uh, ongoing efforts uh, trying to get uh, gain attention and uh, we just love the sticker too with turtle and waves and so thank you um each each winner is going to receive 100 dollar prize so um uh so congratulations and we're going to send it to you when we uh, uh figure out how to send uh funds from through our fiscal sponsors but we will get to you to your email we will contact you soon so congratulations uh diana uh, if you're here, um, if you, uh, if you would, would like to say anything or like anything, that would be awesome. Um, but, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Uh, we're so happy. I uh, hope you will use the money well, like for stickers or like, uh, any, uh, group social or yeah, anything to promote, uh, zero waste and, uh, waste reduction. Thank you. Uh, please move on to the next. And uh, okay, so I'm going by the alphabetical order. Uh, the next is Harlem Reduces. Uh, congratulations to Amy uh, uh, from New York City. Uh, she is very energetic and she's very passionate about waste reduction. Uh, she's going out to uh, trash clean up with the neighborhood groups and um, she has uh, lots of her friends joining and i love the sticker and uh, she's also uh, coordinating a new york city efforts uh, new, new york city reduces um, and she's also helping us with zoom each time so we really appreciate her she's such a nice uh, person and just heart throbs. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. So thank you. So check her out and on Instagram at Harlem, Harlem Reduces and also uh, New York City Reduces. Let's follow each other and amplify. Uh, next. And the last one is uh, Claire from Michigan. Southeast Michigan Reduces. Uh, you can find her on Instagram at semi reduces, and also you can find her at eighty six plastico, uh, which is her business. Um, uh, bulk shopping, 
refill shop uh, in Michigan. And uh, I really, really appreciate her uh, social media post. I could see it's, it might be hard to see from the image on the slide, but like if you go to her Instagram and look at each post, I, I can see that she worked really hard for each uh, post, like three reasons to be viral. And then like this one that's showing on the screen, it has like a, uh, a few different uh, uh, decks and uh, I, I could see she rolled it out. And, um, and so I really appreciate it. So thank you so much, uh, Claire, uh, and congratulations. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and so like we'll be in touch uh, to, and uh, I hope you will enjoy. And for those, pe to those people who are um, here today, uh, uh, we'll probably do this again next year. So like, uh, uh, please, when you uh, make a post uh, about BYO, uh, tag us at US Reduces. And if you want to get my attention, it might be also good to send the link to our uh, email info at usreduces.org. That way we can keep track. Uh, please tag us. And uh, um, we, we like to keep seeing uh, great uh, efforts on social media. And also a newsletter is also uh, great uh, to read. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's one of the best ways to reach people is uh, straight newsletters. Uh, um, as well. So uh, congratulations all. Thank you very much for all your efforts. Um, okay. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you're right. That's very exciting. And I, I just want to make a plea that I think for those who are making the effort to get out there on social media, let's support each other uh, with uh, at least by following and then commenting. Um, let me uh, then move over to uh, Jill, who, as I said, has the letter that I have been thinking about writing for at least four years. <laughs> and uh, go ahead, Jill. And I, 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 just to plea again that uh, let's, I, I think this is a great opportunity for us to stand behind one of our own thinking exactly the way, well, I don't wanna speak for everybody else, but exactly the way I think. So go, go ahead, Jill. I'm signed up for the letter. Yes, you are, and you're one of the people. One of the people early on who helped uh, with feedback for the letter. I want to start by just saying how the letter came to be. I was driving along a highway, Merritt Parkway in Connecticut, coming back from a meeting, going to New York, and I uh, stopped at. We, they have the highway with gas stations with a little concession, and I went in there and I wanted a cup of coffee. I brought my metal mug that was sitting in the car. And I said to the uh, person uh, at Dunkin' Donuts, could you please give me a cup of coffee in my mug? And she looked at me, she said, if I gave you coffee in that mug, she said, I would be fired. Well, I was, you know, this was here, we've been doing BYO and getting people in Columbia County signed up, businesses signed up for BYO. I thought that was absolutely crazy. And particularly, I came back from Europe I where uh, Starbucks is uh, already doing BYO and you could get you could get uh, reusable cups there or, or mugs there. And it, it was just it just it just didn't sit right. And I said, I need to do something. So I said, well, I'm going to write to the president of Dunkin Donuts. So I began to search for who is the president of Dunkin Donuts. Well, Dunkin Donuts is not a, a, a single entity. It is part of something, a company called Inspire Brands, which owns Duncan and Arby's and Buffalo, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings and Baskin Robbins and a whole host of businesses. A actually, uh, they have 32,000 restaurants and uh, 2,900 franchises and have they have a revenue of something like $32.5 billion. That's, that's, uh, and they're worldwide. They have 50, I believe it is um, 57 global uh, locations. So they are a huge company. And it was like, well, okay. I, I said, I, I had said to myself, I'm going to write them. So then it was a matter of digging up their headquarters are in Atlanta. And it was a matter of digging up whom we could write to there. They're not, you know, checking the website. So we found one person uh, who is a chief communications and impact officer at Inspire Brands. That's the name of the, the, this corporation. 
And uh, he had actually uh, been awarded in 2021. He accepted the Leaders in Corporate Citizenship Award. And he said, at Inspire Brands, we believe in doing the right thing first and foremost, because actions speak louder than words. Well, I thought that <laughs> uh, well, he said that they want to do good things. So I wrote this letter, which I then gave to some friends and and to uh, Yayoi and, and Stephanie and a bunch of people. And uh, they gave me good feedback. So it became stronger and stronger. Then Yayoi said, well, let's send it over to Beyond Plastics. And she had somebody read it over there who gave some very, very strong feedback. And now we have a letter and we would like everybody uh, to sign on both individually and through their organizations. And we're going to send it and hope that it has some kind of impact. Um, we thought the easiest way to do this, uh, you'll, you, you'll get a, a copy of the letter to make sure that you're comfortable with that and your organization is comfortable. And uh, if, you, if you have any hesitancy, then you'll let us know. Otherwise, we will assume that you are okay and that, and that you would like to join that. We have your organization's names. So you'll let us know if you're not okay and we certainly will not add your, your organization or your name. But And if we don't hear from you, we assume that it is okay to send that letter. But please, you will see the letter. It will be sent to you. And uh, uh, let's hope it makes an impact. And let's hope, I mean, they have such a huge Throughout the world, they have such a huge uh, footprint. They they have so many uh, outlets that imagine if they allowed BYO and uh, the, the amount of waste that they would be able to reduce if that were the case. So if any, well, thank you. I see a few hands, hands clapping. But I think as, you know, th th this was just a matter of all the times I thought, well, we should do something and write something. And uh, it, it really felt good to do it, to do something and, and to get the feedback and to realize through that, that we really are part of a network and a powerful network if we utilize it. Thank you, Jill. Um, it is, uh, I think could be very powerful. And, you know, there's precedent that all of our groups already know about for uh, BYO in coffee shops. And there's Starbucks, uh, which is allowing BYO now um, across the country. So, yeah, I think it'd be great if if uh, whatever we can do to push them in the right direction. Um, anyway, just it's amazing that you've you've taken on this initiative. So thank you uh, from all of us. Uh, OK, and now does anyone have any questions for Jill? Otherwise, I will move into introducing our guest speaker. Okay, well, thank you, Jill. And um, let me introduce Amber Schmidt, who has kindly agreed to join us this evening. Um, many of us know of Amber from the work that she does. Uh, she is with New England um, Rethink uh, Disposable at the Clean Water Fund. I was reading her bio. She started uh, as an environmentalist at a very young age. She still looks very young. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for the last 10 years, she's been in Rhode Island, where she became Providence uh, Canvas Director for Clean Water Action. And then about a year ago, uh, she transitioned to working directly on reducing single-use disposable foodware in restaurants, schools, emergency food providers, and for event spaces with Rethink uh, Disposables program. So she's going to talk to us this evening about what do you need to do? How, if you wanted to help uh, switch school cafeterias over to reusable foodware, what would it take? What has she learned from that? And so without further ado, let me introduce Amber. Thank you so much, Amber, for being with us this evening. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for asking me to join. Uh, I'm very excited. Um, I will um, go ahead and share my screen. And as I do that, I will also just say that this really um, could be like the beginning part of a three part um, series really on reducing waste at schools. Um, sorry, I'm having a little trouble trying to get this to 
move. Um, let me try not sharing. Okay, let's just get this in present mode before I talk again. <laughs> so um, yeah, this really could be um, the first part in like a three part series really um, because um, there's just so much um, when it comes to transitioning a school to reuse. Um, it, this is really kind of the beginning steps. I could do a whole other briefing on, you know, once you move to, you've got everyone on board and you want to get to to implement reusables, the education, the training, the, um, you know, the flow of the kitchen, how that's going to work. Um, and then, you know, kind of the final series would be, you know, how to continue that program, how to keep it going, um, how to how to make sure that you're not losing um, and how to continue the program as students kind of, you know, graduate out of the school. Um, so um, this is the agenda that I have for today. Um, there's a lot of information that I have in my brain. And I will also say that every time I give a briefing, um, I will always leave a few hours later. There's always something that I feel like I should have brought up, right? It's a little, oh, like that could have been a really great um, anecdote to add. Um, I'm really hoping to get through this with, um, give you guys as much information as possible and then open it up to Q&A because I feel like that's really where, um, you know, a lot of the questions about where you are in your own kind of process is. Um, I will say that I'm sure that if you are working to transition to school, you're somewhere in this process, this kind of beginning stage, unless you, you've actually started to move towards, um, you know, installing a dishwasher or working with a third party washer. So there are um, really important decision makers that all need to be on board. Um, and I made, I put a little quote here um, from Thoreau, um, though I do not believe that a plant will spring up where there is, where no seed has been. I have great faith in a seed, convince me that you have a seed there and I'm prepared to expect wonders. I think that's really the, the um, really great quote for what you've got to do um, to show these uh, decision makers that you've got a seed. Um, so in, I think there's three different kind of sectors of, of, of decision makers, um, the school administrators. Um, this can be the school board itself looking at the entire district. Um, it could be, it definitely needs to be the superintendent. Um, they, they will absolutely 100% need to sign off on this. So will principals um, as well as teachers. Um, if any one of these decision makers in any of these categories is not fully on board, I have seen entire projects completely shut down from one person not being on board with this. And that just becomes a, a domino effect. Um, they start to sow the seeds into the rest of the decision makers and the entire process can halt. This actually happened to me recently with a school in Rhode Island. We were set to move 14 schools to reusables. One teacher had an issue with the reusable trays and now none of the schools in the entire district are moving to reusables. Um, so it is really important to be educating everyone along the way. Town departments, public facilities director, it's gonna be really important to have them on board, especially if you're looking to install a dishwasher they're gonna need to know. <laughs> um, and they're gonna have a lot of information that's gonna be useful if you are looking to install a dishwasher. Department of Public Works, I think that's really important because a lot of schools um, have municipal contracts for waste hauling. And when we're looking at transitioning a school, there's gonna be a lot of things that you wanna do to convince the schools. One of them is going to be savings, cost savings, right? We all do this work because we're environmentalists, but the biggest um, you know, factor that really gets people thinking about moving to reuse is when we can show them that they can save money. And if the school is not paying for their waste hauling and it's going through a municipal contract, the Department of Public Works is gonna see those savings though. Um, so having them on board. Um, sustainability officers, um, your mayor, elected officials, 
um, all can be very helpful, especially when you move to looking into funding. These are the people who are going to be able to advocate for you, write letters of support for you. Um, so getting them on board um, is going to be really important when you get to that, you know, we've, we've, we've gathered all the decision makers and now we're ready to find the funding, get the dishwasher, work with a third party wash hub, kind of get the ball rolling there. Um, and then, of course, lastly, food services. Um, you want to make sure that you're working with the food vendor. They're ultimately the ones that are going to have to convince their kitchen staff that this is something that they need and should be doing. Um, kitchen staff themselves, getting them on board. Um, it's really important whenever you're changing uh, the someone's job description <laughs> that they are aware on board and really comfortable with uh, with that transition. Custodian staff um, that th we actually find that custodian staff really kind of get on board pretty quickly with reuse because they don't have to be hauling trash out a lot. <laughs> and then if your school is already doing any compost or waste hauling, recycling, um, those you can also get them on board. Um, I, I say definitely compost services. Um, it's that's really helpful. It just kind of shows that there is already a sustainability measure in place. Um, and so I've gotten some feedback of sharing this uh, PowerPoint previously. And one of the things that I I, I think that I'm going to be asked to do is is to come up with some templates, like how to reach out to these folks. I do find that um, you know it, it's. It, it's pretty easy just to get something out there to them, but getting them to respond is going to be a little difficult. Um, so that's kind of where um, we'll go a little bit later into your accountability team. So you're also going to need to do a needs assessment. If you're looking in your district, there's a few questions that I ask, which is, are there any schools that currently have dishwashers? And that sounds strange. But you would be surprised how many schools actually have dishwashers that are not using them for reusable cafeteria foodware. Um, if they do have a dishwasher, it could be a pots and pans dishwasher. Some of those can be outfitted with racks to clean reusables. So it's important to, to go through each school and ask these questions. Um, you also need to know which schools have space and infrastructure. Unfortunately, we have crumbling infrastructure across the country. Um, schools are one of them. And they are, you know, at least here in New England, some of them are very old. And I'm talking over 100 years old. So their electrical may not be up to date, right? Their plumbing may not be able to handle a dishwasher. That does not mean you can't go to reuse. Um, there are other models and other other ways to get the school to transition to reuse, but you need to know what you're working with before you before you approach um, any one of the decision makers to say, well, we want to install a dishwasher here. Um, a lot of schools have dishwashers that are defunct. They are just sitting there um, and someone has never tried to repair or replace them. Those are really easy. We already know the size of them. You already know the specs of the dishwasher, whether they can, you know, whether they're they're able to just kind of uh, plug and play, you know, switch it out with a better dishwasher, or even just get someone in who could repair it. Um, you know, it's, it's it's really surprising when you go into schools, um, things that are kind of just there, um, and it's just been out of sight, out of mind. Um, you know, wh you want to know which schools, if any, you want to put new installation in. I think it's also important to be looking around at third party wash hubs. Um, here in New England, we are really um, fortunate that soon we will have a third party wash hub who is able to service schools for their cafeteria reuse without schools needing to put up money for dishwashers or to figure out the, the staff time to clean, et cetera. And really most importantly, is there, a, is there, is there my dog? Is there a school um, being built um, or renovated? Um, it is extremely frustrating for me to hear and see that brand new schools are being built without dishwashers. We are setting up generations of of of, of students to have to use disposable items. 
And it's something that's just really kind of overlooked. I'm really diving in actually with some archi some architectures uh, on why this is happening. And the biggest misconception that I hear is that they don't want to deal with the labor. Uh, we, we think that the labor is going to be a lot, which is just factually not the case. Um, the labor to wash dishes, even if you have to increase someone's hours and or hire someone very part time to do it, it is still cheaper than a year long uh, school year of paying for disposable items. I have done countless, countless cost savings analysis, and I have never found a situation that a school would um, would lose money. Um it, I think it also would. It, I think it also. It's not that you couldn't, but um, definitely um, the size of the school makes a difference. If you're if you're serving 200 students, um, doesn't matter what the population of that student body is. It really depends on the meal served, because you're not washing someone's dishes that are going home with them. So um, if your school is only serving a small amount of of meals of lunches from the cafeteria. Yeah, it's a it's a very limited amount of labor. In fact, um, it's generally about two extra hours a day. Um, so here's your accountability team. So little uh, quote up in the top from Henry Ford, coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. So when you're looking at the decision makers, you're going to need to have a team of people who are going to be able to hold them accountable and also motivate each other. <laughs> um, because transitioning a school takes years. Um, I had a school when I first started with Rethink Disposable that was ready 100% to move to, to reusables. We were able to get fully funded. And we're still a year later in the process of, okay, are we rolling it out this year? How are we rolling it out? And that's with the perfect storm of everything working, you know, right when I got into this role for that one district. So PTO, PTA groups, really important. These are also people um, who, when school administrators or food vendors or those, those decision makers, um, they will listen more, <laughs> unfortunately, to certain folks um, than they will to just, you know, me randomly as Rethink Disposable showing up at their school and saying, hey, I think you should do this. Uh, PTO and PTA groups are great. Um, they can start to set the tone of where they want the school to move. Um, green teams, a lot of schools around here, and I'm not sure what schools are like in other areas. Um, if you don't have a green team, it's a great opportunity to start one. Um, these are folks that are often helping in the cafeterias. That's really important for when you get to actually implement reuse or when you're laying out your proposal of how reuse is going to be able to, to work, right? How are people going to help students make sure that their um, reusable trays are, are being put on a tray dolly to go back into the kitchen for washing and that they're not going to be thrown away? Um, and um, students, of course. Students are great. Um, I'm working with a student at several schools, um, one um, in, in a town um, uh, in Massachusetts. And I can tell you that I have been working to get in touch with um, this one person in the school. Um, we've had responses back, um, you know, okay, it, it's, it's gonna take me a while. I need some time. You know, here's another timeline of when I think I can get to this. I had a student reach out, not about reusables, but about implementing share tables for food um, in the elementary schools. And I can't tell you how quickly they, they everyone on that email chain responded to that student. Um, and then offered that student opportunity to get on a student-led team um, to kind of help further this along. So that, that's really important if you, if you can, if you have a student, um, if the students have a green team or sustainability committee, um, consultants, <laughs> folks like um, Rethink Disposable that can say, hey, remember you set up that meeting or we wanted to set up that meeting, just checking back in again, um, where are we in that process? Um, we can kind of hold that timeline together. Um, and there's other consultants, not just Rethink Disposable that work with schools, um, Center for Environmental Health is one. Um, 
And then I think your existing programs. So I put a little compost there because again, I think reuse really, and I'm noticing there's a, a typo there <laughs> with existing, but um, you know, if you have a program like a composting program that's that's happening, it really goes hand in hand super well with reuse. Um, just the way that the cafeteria flow happens, the amount of waste that you're reducing, the cost savings, how the, the savings from reuse can actually help pay for the composting program. Um, so they can be huge advocates and you can also point to those successes. Um, so if you have an existing program, whether it, it, it could be a uh, school garden, could be an onsite composting, um, could be you know any number of sustainability programs that you can get in touch with to kind of help show that, hey, listen, this was once an idea that we didn't know that it would work. And now here we are with this great program that students love and we have, you know, a lot, um, a lot of success with. So I wanted to also create a little timeline for folks. These months are completely arbitrary. <laughs> and um, depending on where you are in the process, some of these items can actually move. Um, so, for example, you'll see in September, cost savings and waste reduction audit. If you are already in conversations with decision makers and stakeholders and they are for moving forward, you can get the information that you need to do that cost savings much sooner than later. Um, but you do need to have those decision makers buy in because you're not going to be able to do a cost assessment if you don't get their food vendors information to find out how much they're actually spending, right? Um, so, you know, just kind of a little a little month by month here. And I kind of did the, you know, summer months. Um, I think it's also really important when working with schools to know when your schools are busy um, and know when folks will have time to actually work on this with you. So, you know, convene your allies, start the needs assessment, bring together the stakeholders, Create your own progress timeline and set clear goals. Present at meetings, whether it's the PTO or PTA meeting, green team meeting, town hall meetings. Um, set meetings with the decision makers. Get their buy-in, which, again, if you're going to be doing all of these other aspects, you're going to come to them with a, a with you know, a presentation already. Hey, listen, we've done a needs assessment. We found out that the, we have these schools. We've kind of made a determination that you're spending X amount of money or this much waste is being you is being sent to an incinerator or a landfill. You're, the more prepared you can be, the more likely the decision makers are to, be, to buy in, especially when you're offering to do the work. And in my case, I'm often doing the work for free. It's because we offer free technical assistance. So um, the more that you can make that attractive to them, the, the, the likely that they will buy in. Um, and then you wanna start researching funding opportunities and needs. That's also gonna be really big when it comes to urgency. Um, decision makers will need to need to know that this is urgent. If there's funding opportunity that's coming up in the next couple of months, you need to start this process as soon as possible. It is extremely unlikely that you are going to get a grant to fund a program that you have done zero research on, you have zero ability to implement the program, you have no numbers put together. So that kind of sense of urgency can also help them to, to buy in, to just start giving you the information that you need. Um, do a facility stores, identify the schools, Consider different models for reuse. Um, again, there's a third party wash hub reuse. Um, there's also a centralized kitchen model, which we've done in Palo Alto, where one kitchen was large enough. It's where they really prepared all the food that then went out to all of the schools. And they were able to put a very nice, large um, dishwasher in that school and truck all of the dishes to that centralized kitchen, same as they would trucking out all of the food. So all of the food and the clean trays would go out and then the dirty trays would come back. Um, figure out how to incorporate it into the lunch flow. Again, having that kind of set up 
plan of we we see that the students do this this is easily where we could do a return bin and make sure you're doing ongoing check-ins i like to set regular meetings every so often um so you know let's set a meeting in two months to check in let's set a meeting in four months to check in um, again remembering to do it during those times of the school year that they're going to have the bandwidth <laughs> um and then in September, cost savings, waste reduction, um, audit, start applying for the funding opportunities. At this point, you should hopefully, you know, be able to have that buy-in that if you can say, hey, if we're able to get the money, can we move forward with this one school? Um, and it's going to be unlikely that you're going to transition an entire district. It's generally going to start school by school. And I'd also say that it, it's usually best to try to start with elementary schools. Um, the kids are really uh, adaptable to learning to change. We have a lot less um, loss rate when it comes to utensils. Uh, you can also start to advocate for policy changes. A lot of schools here in New England are starting to require their food vendors to have sustainability officers, specifically focus on sustainability in the cafeteria. If you don't have that, if that's not a policy when they're putting out um, an RFP for their food vendor, Start to, to find if you can. Um, also, local and state ordinances can make a huge difference um, in getting those, those policy changes and starting to, to push the needle in the direction that the schools uh, you know, need to start moving. Um, and then create educational materials um, for students and faculty. And that's going to set you up for kind of that secondary, um, uh, you know, presentation that I could give in this entire process, which is that education could be because it is, I will tell you, it is just so important to, to have every single person educated and feeling comfortable before you introduce um, a reusable. I have seen time and time again, reusables get introduced where they've just said, oh, we're doing it. Here you go. And next thing you know, it's falling apart. They're ending up in different parts, you know, utensils are ending up in different parts of the school or it's just, they're getting lost or, or you know, there's just, it's too uh -huh. disjointed to actually be successful. Um, and the last thing that you wanna do is create a reuse program um, that is not going to succeed. Um, it's better to plan small Plan a timeline for something small with a greater agenda later, um, because if you go, if you shoot for the stars and you fail, unfortunately, it's one of those um, changes that people become very reluctant to try again. Um, so, um, so that's just a little timeline there. I uh, wanted to kind of go over, you know, the cost savings um, that I talked about, right? Um, disposables cost a lot of money. Um, and they're only going to go up in price, um, it's kind of like gas or bread or eggs, right? <laughs> the cost isn't going down. And I think there's really great, um, examples to even put in, you know, during COVID when we had supply chain issues, um, if you have reusables in your school, you are not going to have to worry about them ever costing more money once you've purchased them, unless you need to, you know, reorder small, you know, uh, stocks for break, you know, damage and stuff like that. Um, so if you can, um, you know, work with a food vendor to determine the, the cost of single use disposables being used, um, account for those projections. Um, I'll also, after I get through this presentation, I did um, create a little handout that kind of shows a, a cost savings per student which can be really easy to show, like if every student, um, if you were to switch from a styrofoam tray to a stainless steel tray, you can actually save like seven to nine dollars per student per year. So you can just multiply that by how many meals are served and see, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, so that's a little graphic that, that we've made that I'll show you. Uh, waste hauling, how much waste is being generated um, with the associated costs with disposal pickups? Um, your food vendors should also have the information of of the of what they're purchasing, they often have a case weight, <laughs> so pretty easy to determine how many cases you need in a year and how much waste that's probably generating. And then labor and utilities. So that's something that I like to add in. Um, you want to know how much labor is actually going to be needed. Um, again, I like to get in front of the obstacles, and as opposed to waiting until it gets brought up. 
right? So I'd much rather say, actually, with this dishwasher, with the amount of students that you serve, it'll only take this many cycles to wash the dishes. Most dishwashers are 30 to 90 second cycle. I worked with an emergency food provider on the Cape um, for a reusable takeout um, program for their um, food delivery service. And um, we partnered with a local school that has a dishwasher that donates the use of their dishwasher for sanitizing. Um, and, and they wanted to know how much, you know, how much water are you using? So we found that we needed 25 cycles to run 115, 200, about 300 reusables through the, through the system, reusable clamshells. Most dishwashers also are gonna be using about a half a gallon of water. All of these things you can find on the specs when you actually determine which dishwasher you're gonna use. This is a basic kind of chart that you can use to come up with those numbers. Rethink Disposable has a very in-depth <laughs> um, cost uh, you know, savings and waste reduction audit calculator. Unfortunately, it is our intellectual property. Um, so, and it is very complicated, lots and lots of formulas. But I wanted to give you just a very simple kind of template of what you can, as hopefully most of you can, um, you know, Excel spreadsheet this out um, to, to find that, that information. And again, um, if you are not able to get in touch with the food service vendor, or if you're get, hitting that as a, as, a, as a roadblock, I will show you the other graphic that I have at the end of this, um, where you can just use that and say, hey, um, so I want to talk about precedent. Um, where ha is reuse happening in schools? Because it's happening all over, right? Um, at all different states. Um, so other districts in your state can be really helpful. Um, you know, here in New England, um, we're pretty competitive, so when another town is doing something, um, they're getting a lot of credit for it. Uh, you know, other towns don't always like that. They they want their you know spot in the, you know in the spotlight, their their day in the sun too. Um, you can also use them as, as examples, right? Um, if other school districts are doing this, it's because they see a value, they see a savings. This is, we're, we are not proposing something that is impossible, um, that is not completely doable. And, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. And if it makes sense to other schools and other districts, why doesn't it make sense to your district? How do we bridge that, that, uh, that, that mindset change that we need them to see? And if you have another district that you can talk with the green team, if you can talk with the superintendent, uh, that's going to give you another tool in your tool belt to be able to bring them into a meeting, right? Um, I think getting that face-to-face -face time with one superintendent to another to say, hey, listen, no, we did this. One food vendor to another food vendor. Um, also looking at nearby state laws. And I bring this up because more and more states are moving towards policies that reduce single-use disposables and reduce plastics. For example, I live in Rhode Island. I work in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Rhode Island now at, will be implementing a statewide polystyrene ban, meaning no styrofoam. A lot of schools in Rhode Island were using styrofoam trays, right? Uh, they no longer can. Luckily, we're working with them, and there's been a huge grant that's been um, open for schools to apply from the Rhode Island Department of Education. But when I talk to, to, to Massachusetts schools, I say, listen, like the writing's on the wall here. You know, these policies, these state laws are coming down, statewide bag bans, statewide, you know, um, styrofoam bans, those are happening. So if your school is using those materials, um, you know, even if they're using compostable materials, uh, Rhode Island has a statewide ban on PFAS in food packaging, right? If school doesn't know if their compostables contain PFAS chemicals, which um, it's pretty easy to tell if they don't because they have to be BPI certified, it is much harder to tell if they do um, just because they don't advertise that, right? They don't want to advertise they're putting toxics on the on your compostable um, food tray for your school. 
Um, but you know, if that happens, that, that's going to force schools to have to get BPI certified loans, which is going to increase their price, right? Also, the local ordinances. So all of that, that that could be happening on the state level, depending on what's happening in states around you. Uh, there's also those local ordinances. You know, there are towns that I know of that are, you know, saying like, you're not able to use single use plastics for dine-in. If you have a dine-in area and you're going to sit down to eat in your restaurant, you need to serve on reusable foodware. We're no longer allowing you to use single-use disposable plastics. Um, and in that town that I'm aware of, the school is exempt from that. But at, at what point will the school not be exempt, right? Because uh, that's the trend. That's where it's going to go. So being able to point that out and say, listen, we need to get ahead of this. And that brings me to the other one the grants and the money that's available. Reuse is a huge focus in waste reduction. It's being included in climate pollution reduction grants, in um, climate action plans. Uh, there is state funding, there is federal funding that's becoming available. There are um, foundation fundings, individual donors. People are tired of seeing microplastics, they're tired of the pollution problem that we have in our oceans. Money is, is available. And um, if, if your school isn't ready to, to move towards that, they're gonna miss out. They're gonna miss out. Um, eventually the laws are gonna catch up and they're gonna have to make the change anyway. And it's gonna be much more difficult in the long run. And they're not gonna have seen the benefits um, that all the other places that are, are able to capitalize on this are. It is also um, important to know your local and state climate goals. Prepare information on how moving your school to reuse will help achieve those goals, right? Um, most places have these goals. Uh, they need to be moving towards them. They're being held accountable to those goals. So when you can add that in, it's just going to give you another tool in the tool belt. So how much volume is being diverted from landfills and incinerators? I often find this with like how many tons of waste the school is generating. Um, but there's also, you know, there's the calculators from the uh, EPA and stuff that you can find, you know, how much space things take up. Um, greenhouse gas emissions. I like to think of greenhouse gas emissions in two ways. Um, kind of what is, are the emissions from manufacturing and transportation, right? Uh, because compostable atoms actually cause a lot of emissions, right? Um, so that's another important distinction to make because again, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, compostables are the solution type of language, you know, you know, conversations happening out there and, and they're not. Um, they, they may be good in certain situations, um, but reuse is going to always be better than compostable. Compostable is still disposable, right? It is still used for a short amount of time and then ends up somewhere, um, most often in a landfill or an incinerator. And then I like to think about the emissions from a landfill in, or, and or an incinerator um, and the impacts on the communities and the public health impacts as well. Um, you're, you may be working with a school that may be near an incinerator or a landfill, right? This could be directly impacting the community um, with, with emissions. So um, again, these are just all real tools to have in your tool belt to be thinking of so that you can get that school on board with moving forward. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about just some, some skills and tools. Um, uh, you had asked me to, to talk a little bit about, you know, going to, to restaurants, um, canvassing, you know, to, to get them to switch to reuse for both dine-in and take-out. And I really wanted to focus mainly on the schools just because there is so much information. Um, but a lot of these can also apply if you're working on, on going into a restaurant. So having an elevator pitch, have facts, statistics ready, right? Um, have examples other districts, be concise. Um, again, schools, teachers, administrators, they have full-time jobs. They are spent. I mean, they, I I don't know how they do it, um, you know, and, and thankfully they do, um, you know, but, you know, make sure that you're not wasting a lot of time. They're going to really appreciate that. Just say, 
I know you're, this needs to be short and get to the point. Um, they'll appreciate it. Motivation, be passionate, um, create your team, you know, get that accountability team, that team that's going to keep you motivated and stay focused. It is a long process. It is not easy. Uh, you will not get off this presentation tonight and go talk to your school tomorrow and have a dishwasher by next year. Maybe you will. I mean, that's, that's I, I hope, but it'll probably take a little bit longer than a year for that. Um, so just just know that and just stay focused. Again, creating that progress timeline can also help you look back on that to say, okay, well, we have moved the needle a little bit, right? So here's where we were when we first started the conversation. Now here's where we are, right? Timing. Patience and persistence. Um, be patient. Again, school officials are crazy swamped. They're busy, they're busy, they're busy, and they're going to be busy. <laughs> um, it's not going to stop. Um, so, you know, give them a little grace, but also nudge them. And again, when you have your accountability team, that nudging can come from different areas. So that way it doesn't always feel like you're the one banging your head against the wall asking them to do something. Know your school schedule. Again, really important that you're not bothering during, um, you know, <laughs> the height of exams or something. Uh, not going to be a good time to even send them an email, probably, right? Wait until after. Um, coalitions. You guys are already all a part of this coalition. Um, join other coalitions. There are national school reuse coalitions. Um, participate in webinars where possible. There is... Um, a lot of resources. There's the Upstream Reuse Solutions Network. Um, CEH has a national foodware um, for schools call. I actually participate in Massachusetts DEP's um, coalition specifically for schools, and I lead their subgroup on reuse. And it encompasses all policy, composting, and reuse. Um, it has been extremely helpful for me. In fact, um, I think I'll actually be giving this briefing at one of our upcoming quarterly meetings. <laughs> um, and then lastly, um, funding sources. Knowing where you can tap in um, to funding um, is going to help, again, and also create that sense of urgency that, hey, listen, if we don't get this funding, it's going to go somewhere else. You probably all know about plastic free restaurants. Um, as long as you are getting an approved vendor, item, they will pay 100% to switch from a plastic um, or a PFAS uh, product, right? So if it's a compostable with PFAS to a non-plastic item. Uh, rethink Disposable, we work with Plastic Free Restaurant, um, but we also will help you write and apply for grants on your own. Um, Again, you know, it does really depend on that on where you are. Um, I wish that we could be expanding even more than we are right now. I'm just in southern New England. We have offices in New Jersey, Philadelphia, Minnesota, and in California. Um, there's also a Center for Environmental Health that also works with Plastic Free Restaurant and may also be able to help kind of funnel um, where funding sources can go. Also looking at state funding sources really lucky here in, in um, New England that um, in Massachusetts, they have a mass DEP reuse micro grant. They have a lot of opportunities for reuse, so. Amber, I just, I'm gonna jump in. Oh, yes, at the, yes I just wanted to say, I, I just wanna make sure we have a few minutes for questions, um, but it sounds like you're on your question slide. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm so sorry. And I know I'm like, I try to condense everything down and then I start no, talking so great. I just give you all this information. So. Um, I will also um, uh, stop sharing, and then I do just want to also share the graphic just really quickly, but if folks have questions and want to start. Um, just while you're pulling that up, uh, let me, um, there were a couple of things that came up, uh, more sharing, I would say, in the comments, um, and I'll talk about those in a second. I just, for those of you who are wondering, am I in the right meeting, this, you know, so there are quite a few of you I know that are activists on reusables stretching beyond just the reduces programs that we're talking about here. And um, so it's it's a it's a it's a jump to think about also uh, looking at schools and what we can do to influence there. But I found it fascinating, actually, Amber, that so many of the things on a micro scale, especially in that last slide on skills, 
I think we, all of us who have a reduces group face those uh, challenges all the time, uh, having to come up with an elevator pitch, having to really quickly convince people who are busy figuring out who the right person in that business is that we can most influence uh, to get that ultimate result, which in our case is a, a simple result, uh, but we think powerful, which is getting that sticker in the window so that we're communicating about the potential for reuse or the, the possibility for reuse in that establishment. I think for those of you interested in going the next step, um, it sounds like, Amber, you are a phenomenal resource on how to make this kind of thing, reusables, happen in schools. So uh, thank you for that. I, I just want to quickly say there are a couple of people who wrote in the chat uh, examples of really inspiring um, videos that they've seen on school programs, including Jamie Oliver's. And uh, Yayo shared one as well about... Um, uh, Japanese cafeterias. So please, if you miss that, uh, go back and look in the chat for those links. And I want to open it up now. We have just a, a few minutes um, for maybe two or three quick questions. So if you want to just use your raise hand function or just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Uh, someone asked, uh, but directly to me, I think by accident, what was wrong with the tray that the one teacher denied? I was wondering that too. <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately there's a lot of conversation which I feel really miss, it is misinformation and misleads the conversation that um, apparently foodware can be used as a weapon. So the tray, she said, could be used as a weapon. Now, Boy. a book, can be used as a weapon. A phone can be used as a weapon. Scissors in the school can be used as a weapon. So it's really interesting why foodware specifically becomes that issue um, and not all the numerous other things. I would also say that this kind of outline uh, to your point about like, it, it really can also um, uh, transfer over to like your work with schools. So like, or work with restaurants, right? So like chamber of commerce is like, who do you need to get on board? Who are those decision makers, right? Who's yeah. your accountability team? Like yes. all of those things can really kind of transfer just the, the, the model itself. Yes. Yeah. Totally agree. There is no initiative that doesn't need its champions within whatever organization. Um, Adrian, um, you have your hand raised, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I was just curious whether any, if you have any experience or have, know any schools that have kind of like um, milk dispensers on and, and implementing that. I'm not working directly with any schools that are using um, bulk milk dispensers. Um, I am aware of a school that several schools that are, are, are piloting that. Um, there is some, uh, you know, there's some consideration to think because those bulk milk dispensers do use a very large plastic liner. Um, that I, I do not believe is recyclable. Um, so you're kind of transferring the the waste there. So I guess it really kind of depends. Um, but it's it's a good um, it's a good pilot I think to see like how much you know if you can reduce how many actual cartons are going to go. But I think what also can help hugely with that is food share tables recapturing that that you know if you have a carton of milk and it's not being used don't open it let's take it back and give it you know put it in a fridge give it away again great thank you uh shara am i saying your name correctly yeah it's um yeah and um i have so many comments to say i'm trying to make sure i can be focused but so i own a refillery um, and I, from doing the refillery, started getting more and more interested in all kinds of ways of reuse, which is what brought me to this group to begin with. Um, and I have been doing a lot of how to promote reuse and, um, and, and things in my community. And that's actually what led me to getting really involved in the schools. My kids have already graduated out of our school system. But what I started learning more and more is just like the impact and how much opportunity there is for reuse, like, cause again, I think you were, you were saying Stephanie, like, why is this being discussed at this meeting? 
But I know for me, that's what led me to really be very passionate about trying to get reuse as a conversation in our school system. Amber knows very well how hard I've been hiding, trying to do this conversation. I actually just came from meeting with the city councilor about this topic, and I am meeting with our um, waste coordinator on Thursday about it. Um, and it's been, because there's a huge, huge opportunity in the schools about having reuse and it will trickle out to the community and all those other things. So I guess that's why, I guess I'm just sort of re reinforcing the comment you made, Stephanie, that it's um, very parallel and there's a lot of conversations that I think, it, whatever, it all kind of comes together. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. No, thank you for that. And Amber, I don't know if you want to react. I just want to say, I can't imagine any of you are going out in the world of uh, reducing uh, in these reduces programs and you haven't been told as I have been dozens of times, but why aren't you doing something with the schools, right? It's the first thing that pops into uh, most people's heads. And I do think um, it's great to see what the um, what your group is doing, Amber. And uh, one of the questions I actually had is, is there, you were talking about examples of state, uh, uh, cities, uh, schools. Is there one state that really shines in terms of they've got a ton of these schools moving ahead with reusable foodware or is it scattered all over the place? Um, statewide, yeah, it is really scattered. And I think that's part of um, a, you know, a larger problem um, that uh, is we're, we're, we're really kind of not creating those statewide policies, right? There's been a lot of conversations that I've been having about, um, you know, requiring new school construction or renovations using state funds to, re to have a dishwasher, right? Right. Um, and that's not, that's not, yeah. you know, it, there's, a, there's a lot of, you know, momentum around that, but um, it's, it's not happening. Um, I will say that it, there's a lot more states here that are very concerned about the waste problem because we are now closing landfills, shutting down incinerators, and are spending uber amounts of money um, shipping all of our waste, you know, to Ohio and Pennsylvania. And so that that cost alone is, I think, really driving the conversation in the three states that I work in. But I think it is very sporadic. I think it's kind of all sprinkled all over the place. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Um, and maybe not surprising. Um, I want to thank you. And I, unless there's another question, I don't see anyone's hands raised. Uh, there were I'm some. I'm sorry. I have a question. I just. Oh, please for some go reason, ahead. My button won't stick. I no, keep please, kidding. Connie, go ahead. Sorry. I'm from Detroit Reuse and uh, we reuse and. Um, I have the opportunity to speak to the uh, Michigan Green Schools, which is awesome. But I'm trying to figure out the best day and time, time of year, day of the week, and time to to set up a 30 minute quick meeting for school officials. And I'm just worried that you know when I put it out there that they're going to be like, oh, I'm too busy, or you know, do you have any suggestions, or does anybody have suggestions on that? Because this yeah. would be for a lot of Michigan school okay yeah I mean I would try when school is not in session I think also like it really depends I know that some of the schools you know they're, they're going through changes in, in their food vendor services so they're kind of busy with that it depends really kind of where your school falls um in that um in like when they're you know creating their budgets um I would say probably like if you're looking at trying to nail down a date I'd say like midweek probably good um like a like a wednesday tuesday wednesday thursday kind of thing and definitely not a monday and i think probably not a friday one thing also just keep in mind is that um don't feel like you need to get everyone on the on the call right really try to find if you do a doodle poll just say like hey what's a really easy month coming up you know like i'd say like october is a great you know month it's going to be before the holiday months it's kind of already a little bit into the school year so people are kind of like oh you know there's not a lot going on um so aim for something around there maybe um or ask when is going to be the the easiest downtime and then just hold them to it and say if they're not able to take notes have, have a writing notes um that can be shared out 
share that email out once you're done to update everyone, get more feedback, um, and then, you know, work from there to try to set more continuous standard meetings if possible. Thank you. That's the, some good ideas. Thank you. Good luck, Connie. <laughs> that sounds like a, a noble endeavor. Um, okay. I, I'm going to bring this to a close. I hope I'm not missing anyone's questions. Amber, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. And thank you for what you are doing uh, on the ground to uh, really showcase what's possible. Uh, it sounds like